Hi, I'm Jody Cohn, your host, and I'm so honored to be joined by Roland McCready, who is a PhD, the Director of Research at the HeartMath Research Center at the HeartMath Institute. He is a psychophysiologist, and his research interests include the physiology of emotion, heart-brain communication, and the global interconnectivity between people and the Earth's energetic system. So needed right now. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Thank you. So I'm curious, how do you define resilience? Okay. Um, you know, if, if, before I answer that, if you look up resilience, you'll probably find a hundred different definitions. And most of the concepts or ideas about resilience have to do with bouncing back from some type of challenge or hardship or so on. So um, we include that, but our, our definition is basically the capacity to prepare for recover from and adopt in the face of stress, challenge, or adversity. So um, that's a little bit of a, an expanded, uh, more modern, I would say, kind of definition of resilience. And I'm actually kind of honored to say that uh, our definition was adopted by the, uh, pretty much the US military, uh, but, but certainly oh. by the Navy. In fact, we developed the resilience program, the pre-deployment resilience program for the US Navy in their, their highest stress uh, mission. Uh, so we did a lot of training in, uh, in, in this uh, this area. So just to, to unpack that a little bit, if I may. So capacity is a, kind of a new word that you might not see in most definitions to prepare for. Because if our resilience is, if we have a higher level of resilience, then I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a second. We have a more capacity to actually prepare for upcoming challenges that actually avoid us having to bounce back from losing all of our energy is a, kind of a way of thinking of that uh, of course to recover from but it, an adaption being able to adapt to the situations you know in, in a flexible way and flexibility is also a key element of, re, of resilience and almost you know it, it, most people that know much about it uh, or that, that uh, ponder resilience much so by capacity a, a model we use that we find works pretty well. It's, a, it's sort of a metaphor, but it's actually kind of, it's very real at the same time. And that is to think of um, that we have an inner battery. And that, so it's how much energy or charge do we have in our inner battery, right? And that, that's almost equivalent to resilience. Yes. Right? So when our energy is depleted, uh -huh. so our resilience, our ability to prepare for, recover from, adapt, you know, basically our capacity to self-regulate. Uh, is diminished. Uh, so the, the two correlate really quite well. Um, and capacity is something we can build, right? And so another kind of a aspect that's built into that definition. Uh, so in, in the old world, so to speak, old paradigm, resilience was something that was at least that was thought of as something that you have or you don't. You know, you're either born and you're genetically endowed with resilience and the way you're brought up and, you know, or you don't. Uh, no, that's not the way it is. Uh, now we would all have different kind of, um, I'll say baselines or ranges of resilience, right. but we, but our resilience varies day to day. If you think of it as the amount of charge in our inner battery, right? And if we're in a, in a high stress or a high challenging situation or context for a long time period, right? So the challenge is remaining constant Right. It's how, how are we able to maintain our the charge in our inner battery or our energy level to the or capacity to self-regulate. So that, that is actually with skills that we can actually build our capacity. You can actually, you know, um, have more energy. Yes. By learning how to be more intelligent about how we expend it and how we renew it. So I'm, that's a long uh, winded uh, answer to your, your question, but. Uh, no, I, I loved it because you touched on, it's exactly what I, I learned after my son died. People kept saying, oh, you're handling it well. And I didn't really know what that meant. But then I learned that if you have resilience, you're able to navigate through trauma better. And so my whole goal with this summit is to expand people's capacity for resilience. So I'd love it if you could talk about some of the things you know that you've worked on with the pre-deployment resilience program or anything that might be a helpful tool to kind of charge that battery and build that muscle. Yeah, well, I think the, maybe a good starting point for that is the way I look at it, there are, uh, what we actually teach in our resilience programs, 
is that we have four different kind of domains of, re, of energy or resilience. I'm going to kind of use those two equivalently, if, if I may. Perfect. Because they really are. Uh, yeah. So physical, right? right. Physical energy, physical resilience. And if we want to measure that, it would usually be reflected in, in a person's endurance, uh, their, you know, kind of strength and all that, it, but, but also flexibility. And right. flexibility is going to show up in all of these. So now let's just use this, just click on that for a minute in terms of capacity, because that's kind of an easier level for people to understand. If you wanted to increase your physical capacity, I must ask you this, Jody, how would you do it? I would train. Like I, I used to run marathons. So, right. you know, I'd work up and then go back to balance. And, yeah, and so, you would, you would, you, so if you run marathons, you, you know, you've got a high capacity already, but this, you know, the rest of us out here in the world that you know, aren't marathon <laughs> runners. Well, no, but I, I started yeah. with uh, Galloway on running. He had a training yeah. program. Start right. with two so, miles, build to yeah. six. There you go. Yeah. Exactly. So let's say that you're, you're kind of your current baseline. for beginning Yeah. Miles, you can run five miles. Right. It might be for some people, it might be a couple blocks, right? Or fast, right. whatever it is. doesn't matter. So then you have to kind of dig a little bit deeper and stress past your normal and go a little farther. Then hopefully you rest, recover your energy, right? Just like right. And then you do that again the next time. Right. After a few times of doing that, well, now that new goal is your new baseline. It's kind of casual. Right. You're not having to dig in quite as deep and put that extra energy. So you've increased your capacity. Now, why would we do that? Well, in your case, it's because you want to run marathons, right? Or, right. Um, but for a lot of people, like if you're in law enforcement or just a lot of fields, you might there might be times when you need more capacity to draw on. Right. To, to handle a challenge that comes up in life. Right. That's kind of how you've built your, or increased your capacity in the physical domain mm -hmm. right, in terms of you know our energy. Uh, but then there's also the other domain would be mental. Right. And that would kind of be reflected in our mental flexibility is kind of one of the key elements there. Um, you know, our ability to focus, pay attention, um, incorporate multiple points of view, you know, in our these were, which are all uh, kind of in that mental domain. And we actually do have a, a certain amount of mental energy. Um, I mean, I, for me, you know, I may not have uh, expended much physical energy, but I could be at the end of the day after a lot of Zoom calls or this or that and writing and, you know, read a paper or, or something and get it through a paragraph and realize I don't have a clue what I just read. Yeah, I'm probably the only one, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think right. studying for but finals in college. We've expended enough mental energy we, that we don't have that same, right? And it so I won't go through that, but you can build capacity there too, right? Right. So then, uh, the we also then talk about the then the more important one in terms of resilience is the emotional domain. So if we were going to measure that, if that's kind of also emotional flexibility. Right. Uh, what, what's our range, you know, uh, uh, of emotions, um, kind of positive outlook versus cynical kind of worldviews, these types of things. And but one of the key aspects there is self-regulate the, the capacity to self-regulate our emotions. Now, the reason that I'm going to uh, focus more on emotions is that in physiologically speaking and, and from a, an overall energy perspective, emotions are what run the show. And it's where most people um, expend unnecessarily expend and waste a lot of energy. Love it. So if we're dra draining energy, we're also draining our resilience. Right. Right. So, um, you know, um, so emotions are the prime, for example, the primary drivers of the activity in our body. You know, in our nervous system, in our hormonal system, all of these things, it's uh, emotions. And that's easy to prove here in the lab. Right. So we can have people wired up to all the stuff we do, you know, your brain waves and your blood pressure and your hormones and this and that. And, you know, have you doing mental things, you know, serial subtractions and whatever. And yeah, you see some changes, but once you trigger an emotion, boy, big changes happen fast, right? In the hormonal outputs in the body, the activity in our nervous system, heart rate, all of these things, you know, you get embarrassed by making a mistake because you're trying to subtract number, something like that, positive or negative uh, emotions. So they're what really run the show in it from an energy perspective. And then our fourth domain, we, we call spiritual. And that this doesn't mean religion, but, but it more has to do with um, 
how aligned and operational in daily life are our um, commitment, um, commitment is the wrong word, but our, our livingness, if I could say it that way, of our core values. Oh, I love that. Um, you know, our, our tolerance of others' beliefs, right? Right. <clears throat> and uh, so it's kind of a flexibility there as well. And, and so flexibility showed up on all of those. And if you think about it, aging, one of the hallmarks of aging is reduced flexibility. Um, I mean, not just physically. I mean, I, I yeah. watched this with many, you know, my, my own parents, for example, you know, as they got older and older, it was the same stories and the same worldviews and very little tolerance for anything outside of that. Yeah. You know, and the older they got, the more that flex, the loss of that flexibility across all those different domains. So anyway um that was amazing and i i loved i totally agree that uh, it, it really comes down to emotions so can you talk about how we enhance our emotional flexibility well i think the well flexibility well self-awareness would be kind of a, a key there to what we're, we're feeling uh but, but self-regulation as i kind of highlighted when we were talking about that is really the key to if we're going to really it's not only build resilience and capacity, but also I would say sustaining it. Yes. Over yes. The long haul. So when we have, um, you know, we we have different, you know, stressors in life. You know, this is actually where a lot of people get confused, right? You know, we we, we talk a lot about stress, right? So stress, if we look under the hood a little bit. What is stress? Well, it's all, it's always or almost always an emotion. You're totally right. Fear, anger, fear, anger, shame, grief. grief. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you're stressing me out. What are we really saying? Right. You're not doing what I want you to. You're <laughs> pissing me off. I mean, it, it really is That's what it boils down to. You know, yeah. it used to, by the way, it used to be kind of on just to help make that point. You know, not that many years ago, a few years ago, the number one stress stressor or thing that people feel stressed about was time pressure. It's actually called time pressure, mm. and, which is defined actually as the feeling that we don't have enough time or the feeling that everything's taking too long. That's the actual questions about assessing time pressure. So again, an emotion that's actually changed a little bit. So more, uh, more current surveys are showing up to, it's still there time you know time pressure but another one yeah. that's popping up to the top of the list oftentimes is dealing with difficult people <laughs> that's true i mean so it begins yeah it's, it's, you know so there and i think it's just to finish out this thought so there's what we call the stress or the thing outside of us yes and then the stress response but the, the stress is actually in us in response to the thing that happened out in the world Exactly. Right. So it's important to distinguish those because it's once we understand that we, we now have the capacity to deal with those internal responses to the external thing in new ways in more intelligent ways that don't drain our energy unnecessarily. Right. So for a lot of people, it's um, drama, you know, mm -hmm. it's where we waste a lot of energy. Um, right. You know, putting too much significance into small things, you know, when we are able to rise above and see things from a new perspective a little bit. It's like, really, I spent that much energy about that. You know, I mean, you know what I mean? It's yes. Uh, not that you ever have a lot of drama. Jody, I'm not saying that. And I, I have a teenager. You might know people. I have, I have a teenager. I yeah, get to see it go. every day. <laughs> right. Sure. But you understand what I mean. But that's where yeah. we're really blowing out a lot of extra energy. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of energy that goes all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> So does that kind of help answer your question or make that's that's so so perfect i i love it and i and i wanted to shift a little bit into um kind of heart rate variability as a tool for self-regulation sure. well i wouldn't say heart rate variability is a tool for self-regulation but heart rate variability it's a really important aspect here because and well just for our listeners out there when, when what that means is most people know what heart rate is Right, which is simply how many times did the heart beat in a minute. But in reality, our heart rate changes with each and every heartbeat. That's where it's kind of a picture's worth a thousand words here. But so if you in other words, if you measure the time between each consecutive pair of heartbeats, that it's always different. 
right? So it's varying. And if this weren't the case, we wouldn't have a heart rhythm, right? So, and it, this is um, kind of newer understanding. And the more of this natural variability we have, the healthier we are. And it actually correlates really well with resilience. So what we see clinically, uh, you know, I should also say that we have the most um, amount of this natural variability when we're young and as we age, it gets less. And there's almost a, a linear relationship between natural aging and reduced heart rate variability, the amount of it we have. And what you see is, or what we see is when, uh, and we've done a lot, a number of studies in, in, in like military, deploying military populations and, and law enforcement and things. So that when people under a sustained stressor, like being deployed into a war zone for a year or longer, that their heart rate probably starts declining at a much, much faster rate than you would expect from normal aging. And that correlates with basically reduced energy, reflects flexibility and resilience. So the amount of HRV we have is, is actually a good physiological marker of resilience from the, this kind of perspective I'm sharing with you. So- Is that because um, of, of sympathetic? Like they're just in the sympathetic no. branch? Oh. No, what? not necessarily. And that, that's, boy, that would take us down a whole other discussion. A rabbit hole, okay. Uh, well, I'm happy to do that, but-, but uh, No, I just was curious. Um, yeah, keep, but let, keep... um, let's, getting back to your, your question. So the, what heart rate variability is reflecting, it, it, so that's the long-term effects we measure HRV, how much of it we have, but it's called heart rate variability because it's always varying. Right. So there's the, there's the long term, how much do we have? But then in the shorter time scale, it also reflects the pattern of the HRV, reflects our pretty much our emotional state. So when you are frustrated or impatient, these types of things, anxious, you see that the heart rhythm, the pattern becomes very chaotic looking. And we call that an incoherent rhythm. Whereas when we actually feel good, you know, like, especially you know, like an example, you walk out the door in the morning and it's just one of those days, you know, blue skies and the perfect temperature. And, you know, you just go, oh God, what a beautiful day, right? Just, you may not be thinking it, but you're feeling that, ah, appreciation, right? For uh, your heart rhythm shifts into a very different pattern that we call coherence. And yes. as it turns out, if we follow that rabbit down the hole, that is a, an ideal state to be in because the heart actually sends more information to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. And the, 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 I'll just call it the quality, the coherence or incoherence in the neural activity being sent from the heart to the brain profoundly affects brain function. And it actually in, in largely informs the brain to how we are feeling. Right. I love that. So basically what you're saying is if we can feel gratitude and joy, that's kind of like a, a resilience reset. It, it is. Yes. But that's easier said than done. Right. Right. Um, you, you can't, you can't necessarily just think yourself into a more uplifting or what we would call regenerative emotion. Is that we, we kind of divide um, emotions. Uh, we don't use the terms positive and negative as much as we would do to, to, to more describe the effect they have physiologically, depleting and renewing, right? Got it. Uh, so if we go back to those four domains for a minute that I talked about earlier, they, they, do, oh, they do interact. In other words, not, a, a, well, I think most people can, I've had the experience you just get really mad at something uh, at somebody or about something and you have one of those good old-fashioned just blow out anger blowouts and you know rant and rave and you know what i mean and how do we feel a few minutes later say 20 30 minutes after that after we finally calm down usually pretty depleted right yeah yeah so we just blew out a lot of energy it's a great a great example of what i'm talking about how we, we blew out a lot of energy uh even physically we don't have the same energy emotionally depleted and you know it's mentally all of it it blows up those kind of affects all of those so other but when you feel that ah oh, appreciation all right or that you know or, or compassion these types of things they actually renew energy or love when you first fell yeah, in love absolutely yeah yeah oh yeah i remember back when i was a youngster you know i mean all the the energy that we would have when we were in love and oh yeah just, you know i don't know how it went so yeah so, so the, the, the point uh, of this is that if we're going to self-regulate, the 
uh, kind of why I was talking about the quality of the signals from the heart to the brain from all levels that actually have direct neural pathways to every major brain center. And ultimately self-regulation starts in the frontal part of our brain, frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex, where we first have to become aware of what am I feeling, right? I'm starting to, I'm getting triggered or I got triggered, right? So kind of a way to think of this is a, from an emotional perspective. Somebody says something, does something, whatever, you know, especially if we have histories with that person, you know, where they, you know, they have yeah. done, you know, done us wrong, right? Or whatever in the past. And, and they even hint at something that reminds us of that. We, we can get triggered in a way that's way more energy than is probably justified in the current situation. Right. Right. Um, so that especially has a lot of extra charge to it. So once we, that, well, I'll just call it trigger happens or that usually an unconscious perception. You could kind of think of it as the, the train is down the tracks now, that emotion, right? It's starting to go, there we go. But to the self-regulate really means that we become more aware of that's what's happening. So the unconscious stuff starts to become more conscious, you know, as we become more self-aware. And, but then we want to turn around that energy expenditure, that train that before it gets too far down the tracks. I mean, when people start thinking about what I'm saying, you probably have even had the experience of, of, of what I'm talking about that has happened and you even knew it was happening while it was happening and knew it wasn't going to, going to lead to a good outcome. Yeah. But, but it happens anyway. Yeah. <laughs> you can't stop it, even though, you know, this isn't going to work. Right. Right. So self-regulation is, is going to the next level of really self-empowerment to be able to, to stop that train. Right. And turn it around and, you know, head it back in another direction. Right. Energy wise. Right. Right. So the, one of the key ways to do that is to change the input from the heart to the brain. Right. Cause the brain, usually we can't think ourselves, you know, I mean, yes. sometimes you can't see, so um, because that sends a different neural message to the amygdalas and the, and also up to the frontal cortex that gets it literally more, it's more synchronized, which allows it to perform better. Right. More capacity, more capacity to self-regulate. So one of the first steps in most of the, the heart math techniques, um, for step one and most, not all, and these techniques are designed to be used in that moment, by the way, rather than waiting, okay, I blew out all my energy, I'll go meditate or do a hot tub or something to kind of recover. No, I mean, yes, that's all fine, but it didn't it a lot more intelligent not to not blow out all that and waste all that energy to begin with. Right. Right. So when you feel that trigger or you're starting to feel, you know, the impatience, which is a big one for the, we waste so much energy on these under the radar feelings because, because they're so net way they become so normal and natural, right. That we don't even think that about them as stress anymore. Right. Right. Uh, right. Anyway, um, we call it heart focused breathing. Step one, so Love it. heart focused breathing. You basically put your attention, focus your attention in the area of your heart, center of your chest, basically. And then pretend you're breathing through that area. I mean, you actually focus your attention there for, for in the beginning, for some people, you can put your hand on your heart if you need to. But, um, and this is something you can do with your eyes open, you can do it anytime, anywhere. Nobody even needs to know you're doing it. Mm -hmm. Breathe a little slower and deeper than normally. Try pretending you're breathing through that area. Now there's reasons for that. Because when we focus attention in the body, we can shift and change things. The whole industry based on that called the biofeedback industry, right? So slower, sleep a little bit deeper and slower. Uh, if this is not about counting or pacing your breath, but but in the beginning, you know, it's about a four or five second rhythm on the in breath and four or five seconds on the out breath. Okay, and that's the that's the natural resonant frequency of the heart brain axis. So we're wanting to shift into that our natural resonant frequency. This is about a 10 second rhythm. Okay, so that's um, step one, you know, in, in a way that so heart focused breathing, I call it grandma's wisdom. You know, I mean, uh, you probably know what I mean, you've got kids. So yeah, you know, you're, you're, your young one, young and falls down, and you know they start screaming and crying and all that, and you know you pick them up and you know make sure blood's not squirting out, and <laughs> you know you know what I mean. Yeah, a little humor there, but you know, and it, yeah, they're okay. So what's usually the first thing grandma says to them or tells you to tell them? 
Oh, you're breathe, fine. Breathe, yeah. Breathe, right. Take a breath. Breathe. Cause you just know that until they calm down. Yes. They're not going to hear anything and they're not really hurt, you know? Yeah. You know, and as moms, you know, that you, I used to do this with my son and, you know, he would fall down or do something, you know, he's not hurt. And he'd start to do the drama of the win. You'd, you'd laugh at him or something. And he would just shift like that. Ha and off he'd go, you know? Yeah. Um, find those little ways to, you know, so basically you're taking the drama out and the significance out. Right. So you're, you're, you're now you're taking the charge or energy out of that emotional response just by the breathing. I love that. So the key is, is remember that and, you know, to self intervene. So that's step one. So now you've reduced the intensity. So maybe that trigger was, could be anything, right? It could be anxious, fear, whatever, but um, let's just use frustration here that you're starting to get frustrated. So the breathing step, heart focused breathing will take the intensity out. Right. So, but the, if you, if you stop there, that's, that's awesome. You've taken the intensity out and, and reduced the emotional drain, but now you're just feeling at the same emotion at a lower level. Right. So it's still having the same biological and hormonal effects and things. So the next step, uh, and I'm not giving you the exact steps here, but just to basically now replace that, say, frustration with another emotion like calmness or patience. You know, so if you're feeling impatience, heart focused breathing, then step two, breathe in a feeling of patience. Okay. Right. So you now you're consciously taking charge of your emotional diet. I love that. Right. And with some practice, you know, um, you know and this is not something you, that you only do um, practicing when you're getting triggered. If you're feeling good, that's great. Feel even better. Go ahead and, you know, breathe a feeling of a calmness or appreciation or inner ease or whatever the you know, love. Yeah. Well, there, and people have a lot of opportunity to practice, you know, in traffic, in lines. Exactly. Meetings. Yeah. Uh, emails. Um, yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah. But be, beyond step two, what else do you recommend? Well, I think for, for here, that's, there's a, I mean, a lot of our techniques go in, even have four and five steps, but that's a good um, starting point. Starting point. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love that. And, um, you know, I, I'm curious what, what other tricks, like how else do you kind of move up from the, the lower resonant, you know, emotions, the depleting emotions to the higher emotions? Like you can do that in the moment of like overwhelm or anxiety, but what, what are some other things that people can incorporate every day to enhance yeah. their heart coherence? Um, well, we kind of talked about the turnarounds and using this in real time. Right. right. But another thing you can do, um, it's actually very helpful for a lot of people. There's actually very inexpensive devices that actually measure your heart rate variability. Right. And the pattern of it and tell you how coherent or incoherent it is. So doing regular, you know, not when you're out and getting stressed and all that, um, you know, and triggered, but just written on the times is practicing another technique called the heart lock-in where you actually uh, shift into coherence and then you, you, this is something you would do more when yourself in a quiet time and, and really sustain that coherence, you know, for like five minutes, maybe the beginning or into 10 minutes. Um, and it, it's useful to have the, the biofeedback devices it's called Interbalance or m uh, Pro, these type of devices um, that work with your phone or computer. That, so you're getting the, the actual feedback and actually seeing what your heart rhythm is in real time. So it's awesome to see how you can shift it and practice that. But once you the practice being in coherence and then sustaining that for longer times, what you're literally doing is training your brain and nervous system to that as the new normal or familiar state. Right. So we're doing that in our normal, you know, kind of quieter times. You know, maybe I, I do it in the mornings before I start work, just kind of prep, set my day you know, with a more coherent, you know, uh, perspective. And also in the evenings, that by training your system into that as our, what we would call, literally call our new familiar, new normal, it's a whole lot easier to make that shift when we do hit a challenge. Right. It's a bit naive to think, oh, I learned this, these, te these steps of these techniques. I'm just going to wait till I get, you know, hammered and like in a traffic jam or something and I'm late, you know, um, you know or, or that person in the meeting that always does X, 
you know. Um, so that would be an awesome thing to uh, to practice. No, I love it. I mean, you know, we all brush our teeth every day as preventative maintenance. It'd be great to have some emotional resilience maintenance. Yeah. So when I'm really saying it, this this is really about in the moment stuff, right? It's not asking you to take any more time out of your day. I mean, this is actually, you can actually do this when you're in a conversation or while you're driving. Yes. You have to breathe anyway. Why not, <laughs> you know, I mean, why not be a little more conscious of that and to breathe in a way that's that's really adding energy to our inner battery and, and, and our resilience, you know, and um, training our system into that new new norm, that new familiar. So practice in between times, right? Yes. I'm walking to the photocopier or, okay, I got to, why not take that opportunity to do some breathing and uh, instate a feeling of appreciation or care or kindness or the kind of things we need more of in the world. Absolutely. Is there anything related to uh, heart coherence and resilience that we haven't touched upon that you'd oh, like to? Tons of stuff. Uh, <laughs> there really is. So, I mean, there's there's literally well over 400 independent studies now that have taken these concepts and techniques and, and shown that uh, learning how to shift into this coherent state, heart coherence, uh, benefits uh, us in so many ways. I mean, there's everything from reducing blood pressure to better hormonal balance uh, to health outcomes, but also in terms of our ability to maintain our composure uh, in stressful situations, better test scores. Um, you know, yeah. People just feel much better and, and, and do better when they practice these skills. And one of the biggest multiple studies now, uh, in fact, there's a meta-analysis of healthcare workers, about 12,000 people now, that show that their energy levels, we talk a lot about energy. So it's, uh, if we look at, at, at hospital data, which got about 12,000, we do a lot of work in, in healthcare and, and, and nurses and doctors, that it's kind of scary, but about 40, 45% on average uh, in that profession uh, are report being extremely exhausted and fatigued most or often of the time. And after practicing these skills, even just for a few weeks, that is dropped in half. Wow. So big, big differences in the amount of energy we have at the end of the day, so to speak. Um, yeah. So do so, the things we like, you know, the, you know, um, spend time with our families, you know, yeah. hobbies, these kind of things, a lot more energy. So. so for the listener that has loved everything you've said and wants to know what the best next step is, where would you send them? Like a, well, a book, a course, what, which thing? Yeah, well, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of resources on the heartmath.org website. Dot org. Okay. I, I emphasize dot org. People can't help dot com sometimes, but it's actually heartmath.org uh, to access to our, our stuff. And uh, books, a uh, book called Heart Intelligence is a great uh, first step. It's kind of one of our more, uh, recent books. If you have kids or teenagers, actually one of my books is called Transforming Stress for Teens. Oh, it's actually a really good, it's actually a really good book. I mean, I'm not just saying that because I'm one of the authors, but uh, in fact, a lot of adults, it's one of the favorite books of a lot of adults because it's kind of written in a language for a little bit younger, but it's so simple and straightforward and packed full of tools and techniques. Um, I'm ordering that right now. Okay. Um, Thank you. Into science, uh, one of, uh, which I've, we've only kind of briefly touched on, another book called Science of the Heart, uh, volume two, actually, as a great resource. And, and we're, we're, for those that are more interested in the social sides of this, because what we didn't really talk about, well, let me just, I'll go ahead and go there. Um, so we talked about personal self-regulation and what goes on inside of our body, but what we feel inside, you know, if we get frustrated or impatient or whatever that is, that is, that doesn't just stay inside of us. That actually affects those around us in a, in a surprising way. Now, of course, we know that you know, if you're having a, you know, a gathering or something and somebody, somebody shows up in a bad mood and, you know, blah, 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 blah that that's going to have a kind of an impact on the, the energy and the, of the group through, you know, the, what they say and their tones of voice and all that. But there's another, maybe even more important level that's going on, uh, which is the energetic communication. Now, what I mean by that, uh, I'm not going new age here on you, uh, woo -woo, not that that's bad, but the, when, when we put electrodes on the, the body to measure the, the heartbeat, right, the electrocardiogram, or on your, your head to measure brain waves, uh, 
when you stick the electrodes, what you're literally measuring there is current flow. It's electricity. That's why it's called the electrocardiogram. Um, and the heart produces by far the largest electrical voltage in the body. You can measure the, the heartbeat anywhere on the, your nose, toe, anywhere. It, it's huge. It's far, by far the largest current flow, rhythmic current flow in the body. But whenever we have a flow of current like that that we measure, you also uh, generate what a magnetic field. I mean, it's basic physics, right? Current flow, you, you create a magnetic field. And magnetic fields, uh, one of their properties is they penetrate things. They go right through the skin. And that, by the way, this is the same magnetic field our cell phone would use, right? Um, I'm an ex-communication engineer. I used to work for Motorola, something I know a little bit about. So if people don't believe me, then stop using your cell phones indoors, right? Because that's, that's why the signal from our phone, how it gets to the cell tower, even if we're in an elevator, right? Fist cell phones still work. It's the magnetic field that's going through the walls and out in, in the community and carrying the information, you know, our voice or text message, whatever, between our phone and the cell tower. Well, the heart's doing the same thing. So every time it beats, we radiate a magnetic field into the environment, which we can measure. So I, I know this because we can measure it with a device called a magnetometer, which measures magnetic fields. And when, when you look at the magnetic field, you find that and this is all published for people interested in, in, in like science of the heart. I mentioned a chapter on this, uh, that you can see that there's literally different informational patterns being carried by the field. Uh, so in other words, uh, if we look at the information being carried by the field when we're angry versus appreciative or something, it's very different. So we're radiate, we are literally radiating our, our emotions probably a lot more into the field environment. And then other studies show that, I mean, we know that it's, you know, this isn't a concept, this is fact, you know, measured and all that. But that also has a measurable impact on others around us. And we can yeah. measure how it affects others' physiology. In other words, we're detecting at this unseen level energetically, there's a, a, always a communication going on, a communication dance. So and the studies have shown when we're more coherent, we are literally radiating a more coherent signal and field into our field environment. And that can have a lifting effect on others around us, even if they don't have a clue what's going on. You know, us just, you know, uh, eyes open, be radiating love, you know, doing heart focused breathing and radiating love into the field can measurably affect others. Well, I, um, I love that. And I think that's very needed um, always on this planet, but especially yeah. now. Thank you so much for your time. This was amazing. You're welcome. Thank you.